Good morning, everybody. Uh, very good to see you again. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us for our panel on accelerating the hydrogen economy. I hope you all caught uh, the last panel with His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, Bernard Looney and Brian Moynihan, um, really remarkable. And I think the, the, uh, His Royal Highness's remarks at the very end saying that we've reached a moment where the dam has burst uh, on, on climate action, on, on taking responsibility for, uh, for the environment um, is really fitting. And I think leads us well right into our next panel because uh, we, I think we all know that for hydrogen, the dam has burst and that from from being a technology that was uh, talked about but but seen as as niche um, that never quite took off um, uh, despite a number of opportunities we're now in a position where hydrogen seems to be the hot topic for uh, for 2021 I want to first go to a slide from our global energy agenda uh, the publication we uh, launched uh, just on Tuesday um, you'll see right here, um, we asked our survey respondents in our Global Energy Agenda survey, which of these energy technologies will see the greatest percentage increase in investment in 2021. Um, and by far, hydrogen uh, was, the, was the highest. Uh, so people think that hydrogen will get uh, more investment than battery storage, solar, wind, grid modernization, et cetera. Increase in investment, I should be clear. Um, and that was 31.3% of our respondents thought hydrogen. I think that says something about what we're gonna see in 2021. Um, and I'd like to welcome uh, our panelists now um, so that we can talk about, uh, about this uh, and how to make sure that we realize this ambition uh, of the hydrogen economy. So let me bring uh, our panelists on stage. Um, we've, we have Marco Alvaro, the Chief Executive Officer at SNAM. Uh, Robert Doe, the President and Chief Executive Officer at SGH2. Uh, Michele uh, Fiorentino, the Executive Vice President and Chief Strategy and Investment Officer at Baker Hughes. Um, Michaela Kendall, the Chief Executive Officer at Adelin and the UK Champion for Hydrogen and Mission Innovation. Um, and we also have Mazakuzu Toyoda, uh, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer at the Institute of Energy Economics Japan. Um, and I just want to add that uh, Toyota-san uh, contributed an essay to the Global Energy Agenda on hydrogen. Uh, so I encourage everyone to read that. Uh, you can find the Global Energy Agenda on the Atlantic Council website or on the Global Energy Forum app. So uh, welcome, uh, welcome uh, all these pan, all, everybody. Um, I want to get started by simply asking, um, you know, we saw, we have this slide. Uh, well, we no longer do, but you saw that slide. Um, why is hydrogen in the spotlight right now? And, and I want to go to two people who've been working on hydrogen for a, a pretty long time. So um, we want to get started. Uh, I'll first ask uh, Michaela, you know, what is it about hydrogen that has, um, why is hydrogen all of a sudden in the spotlight? Right. Thank uh, you very well, much for the invitation. Oh, Michaela or Michaeli? Yeah. That's, <laughs> Michaela. I'm sorry. Michaela. <laughs> okay, that's going to be confusing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so post COVID, everyone is looking for growth opportunities. So, uh, the the whole world needs growth at this point, and um, it's an obvious target to target green growth. And we were already looking for an exit from the carbon economy, and hydrogen really offers that scale of decarbonisation that it's hard to get from other, other technologies and other fuels. And, and it's really underused. So I think it, it's got a lot of capacity to grow. So I would say that that's the, the primary reason. We really are just getting started. So it's a very exciting time to be in, in this area, as you say. Thank you, Michaela. I also wanna ask Marco his thoughts on this. I agree with everything uh, Michaela said. I would add that as the world moves towards net zero, we finally uh, come to a conclusion of this kind of cold war we had between electrons and molecules. And the net zero forces people to think of what the final uh, state of the energy world will be. We will need a lot of green and molecules to decarbonize not only the hard to abate sectors, but something that's often uh, forgotten about is just the, the huge seasonality we need for, for, for heating. Uh, 
with with zero carbon. And so as uh, zero net zero comes up on, on the agenda, you're forced to look at molecules. And when you look at molecules, you look at hydrogen at the same time, of course, the falling cost of batteries. And I think the realization through the work Michaela and others are doing that the, the kind of the infrastructure around the electrolyzers and the fuel cells has still a lot of scope for cost optimization as we ramp up that production. And of course, we have the European leadership. Ursula yesterday uh, gave a great speech at the Hydrogen Council, the president of Europe. It's clearly a uh, number one item on the European agenda, which means a lot of billions of uh, of capital available and, and a big uh, commitment to 40 gigawatts of green, clean hydrogen uh, by 2030. Marco, thanks. And that actually leads into my next question. We're, we've, we're talking a lot about what about scale, um, moving hydrogen from what is a nascent technology to one that works at scale. And so I'd like to ask, um, I'd like to ask you and, uh, and, and back to Michaela, uh, we're going to get to Michaela, have no fear. Um, you and back to Michaela, what does hydrogen look like at scale in 10 years? So, and then, and then I want to ask uh, Toyota son and Robert, what do you think about it? What does it look like in 20 years if we're really moving towards scale? And then we're going to end with uh, Michaela, nah, Michaela, Michaela at 30 years. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, 10, 20, and 30. How do you see that? How do you see it growing where we're really achieving scale? And start with Marco. Okay, good. Thanks. So um, we think even before 10 years, if we take a five-year view, we've launched a green hydrogen catapult together with uh, Yara, with Aquapower, with Iberdrola. Uh, we, we are committed to making green hydrogen from renewable energy at below $2 a kilo in five years. Uh, and we think that's a tipping point. And we think 2030, really, Europe is already committed to 55% CO2 reduction, which essentially means a lot of hydrogen. I don't know if it's 3% or 5%, but it's a meaningful new market that we have to build from scratch. And the race is on because 2030 is around the corner and five years is even before that. Yeah, that's that's a remarkable ambition. Uh, well, I'm going to get to more on that later because I think that uh, there's going to be some obstacles to reaching that ambition, and we want to talk through those and how we overcome them. Uh, Michaela, what what do you think about what it looks like to get in ten years? I think in ten years we'll have a clear global regulatory framework, which I think is still still yet to be made. I think we've got regional frameworks, which are really exciting and and really stimulating specific regions, specific areas, countries in particular. But, but we really need a coordinated policy and, and, and there are the Hydrogen Council and uh, various bodies that can, that can support that. Um, I think we'll see a global capacity building and, and the investments for that will be made clear. I think at the moment there, there are a number of, of players, but it will be more established in terms of uh, networks and, and, and the, the people that will deliver it in terms of both governments and also um, industries and it will probably have some new businesses at that point that will be the star players you know that the, the uh, they will have, have grown exponentially because this is such a growth growth space so so that's what I'm excited about that that um, that mass manufacturing of fuel cells for example green hydrogen production scaling up uh, you'll be able to see hydrogen vehicles in in I would say every city and and in terms of cars and buses and boats and and then in potentially in homes i'm hoping by it by 10 years time we'll have start to see fuel cells appearing in homes because the cost reductions which are going to be delivered by scaling up the mass manufacturing and the the hydrogen production capacity so um yeah, we'll have then also a diverse set of, of leaders. We'll have we'll have different people leading this this group, and some of the I hope some of us will still be um, participating. But there'll be a new group of people as well. This is really being driven. Climate change uh, policy is being driven by the interest in from young people, and I think that's really important to, to understand that they will be coming through and driving this. So you said that you know uh, rapid. Uh, price decline in electrolyzers, mass production. Do you think that we're going to see the cost curve decline like we've seen in solar PV over the next 10 years? Without doubt, yeah. Okay, Th great. Thank you. I want to move on to 20 years because we're, we're thinking bigger there. Um, and let's first go to Toyota-san. Um, you know, particularly in Japan, what does, what does a hydrogen economy look like in 20 years? And I really want to dig down on the question, uh, particularly with Japan, um, is this 
Uh, are we using um, all green hydrogen? I don't like the color code, but for, for lack of a better term, uh, hydrogen that's produced from, from renewables or clean power, or, or in 20 years, are we still seeing a lot of blue hydrogen or hydrogen produced from uh, natural gas with steam methane reforming and carbon capture, or even some gray hydrogen in the mix in 20 years in Japan? Well, thank you uh, very much for um, a very interesting question. I think um, in 20 years, uh, 2040, um, my hope is uh, at least 30% of primary energy is uh, going to be a hydrogen. Uh, primary energy means primary energy. Um, you know, uh, uh, usually renewable energy and uh, nuclear, uh, both of them are quite important, but both of them primarily for power generation, but hydrogen uh, could be good for power generation and, and also uh, it's good for transportation, it's good for uh, heating, it's good for um, industry, and, and, and so all purpose um, energy is hydrogen. And, and uh, talking about uh, um, color, um, we like both uh, green hydrogen, blue hydrogen, the cheaper the better. Uh, if it is cheap, <laughs> Um, that's welcome. I, and I, I think uh, um, uh, talking about um, uh, Asia, um, uh, particularly Japan and, and Korea, Taiwan and, and ASEAN, uh, we do not necessarily have a lot of uh, uh, renewable energy, particularly we don't have um, um, a wind power. And, 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 and so I think uh, um, the renewable energy uh, is limited which means um, uh, green um, hydrogen is limited. And, and so uh, primarily we are, are making the best efforts to reduce the cost of blue hydrogen, but, but uh, if uh, green hydrogen uh, could be cheaper, uh, we welcome that. Do you see Japan um, importing a lot of hydrogen? So is there gonna be a, a global hydrogen market um, like, like with oil and natural gas right now? Well, uh, yes, I, I think uh, it, it's almost like uh, LNG. Uh, unfortunately, uh, um, uh, we don't have um, uh, a lot of sites for um, CCS. Um, you know, uh, many people um, have some here. If uh, we try to use uh, uh, CCS technology, it may trigger another earthquake. And we don't have a lot of um, uh, renewable energy. Uh, we try to expand as much as possible. But again, as I said, uh, wind power, uh, we don't have a lot. Right. And, and so uh, uh, mostly we tend to think uh, we have to import both green hydrogen, blue hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen from Australia, for instance, and blue hydrogen from ASEAN um, economy, uh, Brunei and Indonesia. And also uh, we are thinking about uh, the import from um, the Middle East and, mm. and, uh, and Saudi Arabia and Abu Dhabi. Um, uh, we tend to think of, uh, uh, to import. And, and we are hoping that we could import from uh, United States. And, and, and so all over the world, uh, it is uh, diversified, uh, 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 and which is good for um, energy security. Uh, the UAE made some really impressive announcements uh, earlier this week on hydrogen. And just earlier today, we had uh, Patty Padmanathan from Aquapower uh, on t uh, two, hour, two or three hours ago uh, at the Global Energy Forum talking about what they're doing with NEOM and their green hydrogen uh, in Saudi Arabia. Of course, you think Saudi Arabia might be more of a blue hydrogen hub, but they also mm -hmm. have what fantastic renewable resources and can produce the green hydrogen. Robert, in your mind, as, as someone who's developed a, a really innovative technology for producing hydrogen that, that um, sort of bridges some of the gap between the, the um, the challenge of producing enough of the, the so the, you know hydrogen produced from renewables while while also producing at a low or zero carbon. Um, what do you think uh, uh, twenty years from now a hydrogen economy at scale looks like? Well, thank uh, thank you, Randy, for for uh, asking me. I was hoping that you would ask me that in the next ten years because that's what we're working on at the moment. <laughs> you can go back uh, and tell us ten years. <laughs> And then but, 20 uh, years, that's you know, fair. I'm, I'm in Los Angeles at the moment, so it's a bit early for me. Uh, and Thank you for uh, but, joining you know, us early in the morning. No, absolutely. So as you know, I'm working uh, today in California because California put out a roadmap for the next 10 years. I mean, the roadmap in California. And it already stated that the next 10 years, only 50% of that can come from renewable electrolysis hydrogen. The other 50% 
will come from biomass, bio-related carbon, low carbon hydrogen. So that's already established is there's another way to make hydrogen. And what we're doing in California is California is building out now, just I'm working with two of the largest, one is a Japanese group, uh, the largest hydrogen company in Japan, together with one of the largest Japanese uh, oil company in the US and in Europe, who is building out uh, the next 90 hydrogen stations over the next five years, 90 of them, which with, with 1,000 kilo per station. So we're talking about 90,000 tons a day is required over the next five years in California. And we are currently building a facility that produces 10,000 kilo a day. Uh, it's a distributed system and we would build more, but we'll be able to provide. And California is the only places that already have 10,000 fuel cell cars. Um, and it has put into regulations for fuel cell trucks coming out in 2024 with zero emission trucks, zero emission buses. We're talking with the city of Los Angeles to supply hydrogen for another thousand fuel cell buses. So these are all happening now. And we are making hydrogen at around $2 a kilo today. Uh, and our hydrogen is a negative emission. We mean that we are lower uh, carbon intensity than green electrolysis. Why? Because we're capturing biomass waste material that would have normally gone to the landfill. So we captured that methane avoidance. So we got a negative emission. So we have an advantage over this. And because of this, over the last year, as Michaela correctly said, the whole world is looking at this. We are talking to some of the largest company in the world who do not have the geographical capacity to do wind, offshore, or solar to look at bio, biomass waste, residue, forest waste, agriculture waste, to turn that into hydrogen. And we see in the next 20 years is a question of demand. The demand we see the next, this 10 years is transport, because transport, we are almost competitive in terms of hydrogen price today. But the challenge, and we have been reached out by the largest cement company in the world, the largest steel mill in the company in the world, and the largest natural gas company in the world, and they are all looking for hydrogen. But the price of hydrogen that they can afford is not the same as what transport can support. So I think that in the next 20 years, those are the biggest demand. And if the price of hydrogen is going down or the right policies in place, the growth in 20 years would be, and Marco would tell me more than anybody else, would be the natural gas industry to replace that massive amount of natural gas and all the millions of pipeline that would require such huge amount of hydrogen. And, and we believe that that hydrogen can be produced from multiple sources. They should be non-colored, but they should be zero carbon, low carbon. And I think the technology to get there is irrelevant as much as the carbon intensity of the hydrogen. And I think that hard to abate market, like Marco said, the heat, the heating system, the natural gas pipeline, and then of course power plants. You know, power plants looking in, we're working with the largest Japanese power plants uh, the other time. And they are looking to inject 30, 40, 50% of their power turbines using a hydrogen. So that's where I see in 20 years are large industries, natural gas, cement, steel, uh, getting their hydrogen supply in order to do carbon hydrogen. Got it. Thank you. Now, Michele, the really long view, 30 years from now, what is what is a hydrogen economy look like? Or maybe even a better question is what is how does the energy system look if we're really net zero? How what how what percentage is hydrogen? What what uh, sectors is it serving, et cetera? How do you sort of think through that down the line? Um, uh, so thanks, thanks for having me on the panel. Um, it's a great question, and actually it's very, very good that you pointed out to the system rather than just to hydrogen, so just to bring a bit of balance uh, to the conversation. Um, you know, I genuinely believe hydrogen is going to be a big part of the solution, but it's not the only part to the solution. Uh, and in 30 years from now, uh, it will be about the system as opposed to a product, a solution, a technology. 
Uh, and so in, the, in 30 years from now, I'm, you know, I'm not entirely sure what will the world look like. What I can tell you is what I wish it will be, mm. uh, which perhaps will point out to some of the things that will have happened for it, uh, for it, for it to, be, to become, uh, to become, uh, uh, to become real. Uh, and let me put a bit of perspective around that because uh, I think it's important. If you just take, for example, the EU plans, by 2050, i.e. 30 years from now, the plan would be to have 500 gigawatts uh, of, uh, of uh, hydrogen-driven uh, you know, capacity. Uh, now, if you look at the ever highest load in all of Europe to date, the ever ever recorded all of Europe is about 550. Uh, so we're talking about you know, creating as much hydrogen-driven, you know, sort of power in a sense, than the entire Europe has ever consumed at its peak uh, in its history. Uh, that tells you sort of how much infrastructure, how much regulations, uh, how much systems developments need, need, need to happen for, the, for that to be the case. You know, sort of the more hydrogen you put, the more renewable you need. The more renewable you need, the more energy storage you need the more smart uh, grid management systems you need. So the more integration you need. So the, the reality is none of this will happen unless there is an integrated solution to the energy challenge, uh, which will include a number of vectors uh, that will drive uh, sort of that, 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 that world. And so in that world, you'll have very clever uh, integration between wind, solar, uh, in a steel gas, uh, you know, sort of, um, in some specific places you might have in a little bit of, of nuclear, some of the more clever um, sort of uh, uh, technologies that are being developed by some of the people on this panel, for example, uh, where pyrolysis will play, will play a role. And so you'll have an extremely interconnected uh, world uh, where electrons and molecules, to Marco's point, will commingle to create an integrated energy system. Uh, so that's the wish. Now, you know, for that to happen, and I don't want to preempt sort of some of the questions you'll ask, <laughs> there is, a, there is, a, there is a, a lot to do. You know, in Italy, we have a say, you know, between saying and doing, you know, you, you go in the middle of the sea. Uh, and so there is lots of uh, water to swim uh, in, order, in order to get there. Well, that perfectly leads into my next question, which is a rapid, I want to rapid fire um, each of you. Uh, what is the biggest impediment to reaching this vision? Now, uh, you can agree with what someone else says, but that doesn't let you off the hook. Then you have to come up with something else so that by the end of this exercise, we have five, uh, at least five items that will be an, an impediment to realizing this vision of hydrogen at scale. So, uh, yeah, I start. <laughs> so you know, work, work backwards. Uh, you can start. Uh, Michaela, you, since you, you just went last, you get to go first. So, Michaela. All right. We have one number, $11 trillion. Uh, is what is needed in infrastructure spend, uh, you know, to get to that kind of uh, level of penetration, just in Europe. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big challenge. That's a, that's a huge challenge. So really it's the spending, the, the investment. Okay, Robert, what's, what do you think the biggest impediment to realizing your vision is? I think it's a how hydrogen is transported and what mode and what form. Is it liquid? Is it ammonia? Is it methanol? or is it gas? So the biggest challenge, just like for natural gas, how do you move it around? And I think hydrogen, once we solve that issue, we come to a way that we can transport it much better than I think it's gonna radicalize you know, the whole system and allow hydrogen to be used globally. Fantastic, so transport of hydrogen. I bet Marco has some thoughts about that. Um, to, we'll, we'll come back to you, Marco, but uh, Toyota-san, biggest impediment? Well, I think, um... Um, how to expand uh, the market. Uh, one of the problem at this moment the ma is that uh, some people like green hydrogen only, other people like um, uh, blue hydrogen only. I think um, blue and uh, uh, green both are welcome. A and um, if you combine those two hydrogen, regardless of the color, 
uh, you would uh, find a big, big market. And, and, and then I think uh, um, scale merit uh, is coming uh, to be seen. And, and, and this is important. And perhaps uh, in the future, we could uh, provide um, uh, produce uh, hydrogen from uh, uh, nuclear as well. And, and then again, the market is, is bigger. And, and so in terms of uh, transportation, in terms of infrastructure, I think um, uh, the scale merit uh, would matter. Thank you. And you know, it, you said about expand using nuclear power. There's an interesting figure from uh, the U.S. Department of Energy um, where, uh, and this ties back also to uh, something. Now I can't remember if it was Michaela or Michaeli who said earlier, one of you two, I think. Don't, if I got you wrong, it's somebody on this panel who said it. But, um, but uh, the Department of Energy noted that um, if you used um, all of the ec ec current nuclear power in the United States um, using uh, high temperature uh, electrolyzers, so more efficient than just from off renewables, um, you still only get uh, about, uh, can, can use, produce about 50% of the total gray hydrogen that's produced in the United States right now. So there's just a, that, that's just something that I, I wanna put out there as a big challenge for us to, to think about um, is the, the amount of power if you're just thinking about producing from, from uh, electrolysis. Um, that's just a, a whole lot of clean power that's already going into the grid that would need to be diverted elsewhere, um, which I think also makes, makes Robert's technology really interesting. Okay, um, Marco, biggest impediment. I, I see several impediments. For, first, let's uh, um, maybe we come back to transport later, but transport yep. will not be an issue because we can move it using the existing uh, gas infrastructure. This was really a big surprise uh, for us. Um, in, in terms of impediments, I see uh, security and safety is certainly something we have to really deal with because the inf industry is so so much in its infancy that even a small accident can have a huge uh, uh, reputational effect on, on on the whole adaptability, especially on the transport side or on the heating kind of a home side. Uh, then as uh, as Toyota, uh, Son was saying, it's really about creating liquid markets and we need certificates of origin. We need to be really strict on what we mean by green, by gray, by blue, by pink, <laughs> by turquoise. I keep hearing new colors coming up. You know, <laughs> who's, who's, gonna certif who's, who's gonna give me a certificate that that CO2 was stored properly in whatever country it was stored? And then the third problem is I see, and this is really a cultural issue, still huge opposition to uh, CCS. We heard about uh, the, the concerns in Japan. We see them in Holland. There's too much concern around CCS. It's, it's, it's a safe, old, proven technology. We should really spend time reassuring people that it doesn't interfere with uh, earthquakes. It doesn't cause any real issue. We need blue. We need to get this off the ground. We also need to just help the industry decarbonize as well through CCS. So these are some of the hurdles. Marco, thanks. I want to follow up about um, just sort of the need to get the industry off the ground. Um, there, um, how do you feel about uh, just just utilizing gray hydrogen for now to start to create these markets, um, with the understanding that gray hydrogen um, can even in, in certain cir use cases would be a lower emissions profile than, uh, say, diesel. If you were just to replace heavy trucking with uh, uh, hydrogen fuel cell trucks that use gray hydrogen, you'd lower the emissions uh, profile. Um, do you think that that is a, a good strategy? Um, sort of makes rational sense from a sort of Im immediate emissions reduction, but from a political perspective, do you, do you think that's a good strategy or, or do you think that there's so much opposition that you need to really focus on the, the zero emissions hydrogen now? I think what Germany is doing is really smart. They they know they need blue, they know they, they need gray, they know they really want to prioritize green. And so you separate the two supports. You support production of green or clean or low CO2 or, or bio hydrogen, whatever is kind of low carbon intensity. That's where you focus your supply money. But when you look at demand, you leave it colorblind for now. You can always make it incrementally tighter later, but a hydrogen truck should be able to run on whatever hydrogen there is. And we should get those up and running as soon as we can. And then, and so you subsidize the use of whatever color of hydrogen, including gray, but you subsidize the production only of low carbon intensity hydrogen. That, that way you've kind of sorted it and you can live with both. That's a really, really key insight. Um, thank you. I think I want to try to highlight that one on on Twitter for those who are out there uh, tweeting. Okay, Michaela, um, the the your uh, biggest impediment. Now you've got uh, unfortunately Marco like listed three, so he's making your life even that much harder. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've got um, my one is is a sort of overview. I think it's about uh, really about legislation and regulatory frameworks and. 
And, and when I say that, I don't really mean about just about hydrogen. I think it's about those regulatory frameworks uh, freeing up um, and unpicking some of the um, the energy system as it is today. And, and some of that legislation right now remains there as, as barriers really to clean energy tech. And, and that's not just about hydrogen. Um, as other panel members have said, it's about biogas, it's about it's about less carbon intensive energy technologies. And, and that's what we need to really focus on. Hydrogen is definitely one of those and it's applicable in certain applications, but it doesn't fit everything. It's not gonna solve everything. We have to really look at an integrated energy system and that has to be a level playing field for those low carbon technologies. And I think the regulatory framework then becomes incredibly important about leveling the playing field. It's about subsidies, it's about taxes, it's about creating um, innovation funds, it's about enabling investors to, to invest in clean energy. With, with So I think there's a lot that can be done there. And, and at the moment, in, in my practical work, when I'm going to clients and I, I'm talking about fuel cells and hydrogen working for them, quite often there is a regulatory barrier. So, so I think it's, it's, it's well worth looking across the globe at some really good frameworks that do exist. And some of them are a bit patchy in terms of success. So taking those best case studies and best practices and then applying them. And, and that will, I think we'll all learn together then globally. I think we've got some regions and many of them have been mentioned today. We've got regions where uh, there are successes and we need to kind of join, link those those regions up and uh, and take yeah, the, the best ideas from everywhere. Got it, thank you. That really, that feeds really well into a question that came from the audience from uh, from Chris Midgley uh, at S&P. Um, and, and just for those of you out in the audience, you can submit your questions through the Q&A function in the app. So we really look forward to, to hearing from you. But Chris asks, um, what mandates would you like to see to accelerate demand to help create the scale which drives prices down? Um, so um, that does, does tie into uh, what uh, Michaela just said, what Marco just said. So we'll go to you first, the, the two of you first, but then I'd love to hear from, from the rest of you as well. To Michaela. Okay, so mandates, um, I'd, I'd like to see um, targets and timeframes um, from from all countries, potentially from regions. Um, maybe they'll they'll compete. Maybe they've got specific geographical advantages that they can they can uh, take advantage of and, and create uh, more challenging targets. And and that's that's what I would I would like to see um, supports for um, industries that want to achieve that green growth. I think that's also important or encouragement of the larger businesses that are existing in the energy system encouraged to um, identify talent and harness that talent in the in clean tech. So, yeah, they, those are the key things that I would suggest. Got it. Thank you, Marco. What are your thoughts on that? So on on. Um... First of all, I think this will really open up a new diplomacy. You'll see countries like Japan that, or Germany that need to import hydrogen, uh, really tying themselves up with companies like Australia or Saudi or North Africa that really have a big export uh, potential, including probably the U.S. for uh, for clean hydrogen. So a, a new kind of bilateral uh, type of agreement between between countries. When it comes to uh, mandates, uh, we think blending is a very good idea. Blending. Uh, clean hydrogen inside an existing natural gas pipeline, you can do it. We've done it up to 10% without changing anything of the infrastructure. We delivered a 10% pure hydrogen blend into two factories for a month without changing, uh, tweaking anything. So we've, we've shown the world it can be done easily at low cost. If you start with a 1% blend, say in California, say in Europe, say in Italy, you're already creating a, a, a great big market for uh, clean hydrogen without needing to, to really invest in anything else. And then the beauty of the blending is you can dial it up or down depending on, on uh, how fast the transport market and the heating market and the kind of pure hydrogen markets uh, really take off. Um, I think we need to really, uh, as I was saying earlier, focus the money uh, on, on the tipping points, really focus on identifying the low hanging fruits. One of them is replacing gray for green, for instance, that's an existing market. Uh, one of them is to use contract for difference, for instance, in steel, uh, rather than 
putting billions in, 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 in of capital and building up new steel plants. Just the governments can provide little support to say, you know, what's the delta cost between clean uh, hydrogen uh, as opposed to coal and kind of green steel as opposed to non-green steel. And you can get, get away with a lot less money. We've seen how quickly the solar industry went from kind of 200 euros per megawatt hour to 10 euros per megawatt hour uh, today. Uh, but we've done that at a, at a massive, massive cost to European uh, consumers because Italy, Spain, Germany, UK, they put all these subsidies on the, ta on the consumer bill. That's a wrong way to do it because that's a regressive form of taxation. You're taxing the unemployed, uh, the pensioner, the student uh, with the same dollar amount as you're taxing, taxing the wealthier off. So I, I think stay away from bills and focus the, the money where it makes sense and, and where those tipping points are. Marco, thanks. Uh, anybody want to jump in on that question? Yeah, I, I like to say something as well. Um, Randy and Marco, yep. I, I, I like the idea, but I think that the big the big elephant in the room uh, as far as the mandate and regulation concern um, is CO2 pricing. Um, yeah. Because I, what we're doing is reducing CO2 and therefore the CO2 price. For example, we are working in California and the reason California is done so well in growing the hydrogen market is because of the LCFS. And the LCFS, uh, the low carbon fuel standards set up a price of carbon, uh, a ton of carbon at $200. And when you start going to countries and say, oh, well, we're gonna go $30, $50, you cannot see uh, the sufficient support um, if you are removing carbon, whether it's a steel mill, whether it's a cement plant, or even reducing carbon from natural gas pipeline, you have to justify by the reduction in CO2 and therefore CO2 pricing to me is the key driver to bring this forward. Robert, following up I, on that, um, you know, the United uh, States has, uh, go ahead, Michele. I, I would just to reiterate one, one thing that uh, it was just said in terms of the carbon pricing. You know, I, I, I'm always fearful of targets as well as of technological choices which are made you know, at a specific point in time. Mm -hmm. And I think it's much more conducive to optimum solution if you create the right economic incentive for then the society at large to make those choices as technologies evolve. And if the problem that we're trying to solve is put less CO2 in the environment and we have a mechanism for associating a, an economic cost to that pollution, then that's the economic cost that needs to be built into the investment decisions that the world at large is going to make. And then the best technology will win and it will emerge. And hydrogen will be one of those, as I said earlier on, but others will also find their way to the markets. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's absolutely right. The goal here is not to have, it, the goal is not actually a hydrogen economy. Hydrogen is a means to an end. The goal is to have a, a, a net zero, a sustainable uh, energy system um, that, that really stops uh, global warming. Um, and hydrogen uh, could be, probably will be one of those solutions, but we want to think about the suite of solutions. Um, we had a, a panel uh, earlier this week uh, with the Republican and Democrat uh, uh, representatives talking about the possibility of uh, bipartisan climate action in the United States. Um, and a carbon tax, <clears throat> unfortunately, was was sort of poo-pooed. Um, not, it's not seen as politically viable right now here in the United States. However, we do have 45Q, um, which which is a, a sort of backhanded way of putting a price on on certain types of car, certain types of carbon carbon emitted in a certain way. If you can capture it, um, you can you put it in the ground or use an EOR and you can put a price on it. Um, th that that that's sort of the beginning of of how we can think about that here in the United States. Um, obviously, there's more work to be done on that. Um, Toyota-san, you had a had to a, a response to that question. Well, yes, I, I think, um, um, are you talking about the carbon tax or carbon No, pricing? well, if you'd like to talk about carbon tax, that would be great. Well, may, may, maybe later on um, yeah. I, I talk about it. But, but I, I think uh, uh, first I'd like to um, 
um, uh, respond to the, uh, the earlier question. I, I think uh, the important thing is uh, international cooperation. Um, I, I think Marco san said. Uh, I, I think uh, um, in terms of two things, one, one is cost down. Um, you know, R and D. See, we have to um, reduce the cost of uh, uh, hydrogen and, and um, CCS. Yes, uh, well, country like Saudi Arabia uh, could uh, reduce the cost and and. Uh, um, uh, how to use it, uh, you know, um, uh, Japan is uh, trying to reduce the cost. And, and so uh, international collaboration is uh, uh, quite uh, important. Also, uh, uh, we have to expand our market. Uh, in, by doing that, we could reduce the cost. And how we could expand the market, again, international collaboration. If it is only Japan, it, if it is only the United States, if it is only uh, Europe, uh, uh, the market is limited. But if we could uh, um, encourage uh, Asian countries to use uh, um, uh, hydrogen and, and the market uh, is expanding, China is a huge, huge market. And, and so international collaboration in terms of cost down, in terms of uh, market creation, I, th I think that is uh, quite important. And, and uh, then I, I think um, 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 incentive is important. And, and, and how do we we um, um, uh, find uh, um, revenues for um, uh, incentive or subsidy. And, and, and then the question is uh, carbon pricing or carbon tax and, and, and emission trading. Uh, still, you know, in Japan, um, a lot of debate is, is going on. Some people like um, uh, emission trading, some people uh, prefer uh, carbon tax. Uh, um, but if uh, um, one of them need to be selected, I would say, uh, carbon tax is uh, um, digestible because uh, it's predictable. Um, you know, um, high, uh, emission trading, um, it, it depends on a market mechanism and, and, and we, we, we cannot have a, 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 a clear a predictability about the price of uh, carbon. Sometimes it comes down, sometimes it goes up. And, and, and so um, I think for industries or for consumers, predictability is quite uh, important. And, and so I would say um, if we have to choose uh, one of the two things, uh, uh, carbon tax or uh, uh, emission trading, um, I, I prefer carbon tax. And to some extent, Japan already introduced. Hmm. Thank you. Um, I want to I want to turn to uh, one of the, the key issues, uh, key concerns that was raised by Robert, but actually ask uh, Marco and Michele, if you might be able to comment on the transportation piece, because I know the two of you have uh, uh, Baker Hughes and Sam have a partnership. Um, and I think one of the most interesting things about hydrogen is that it, it potentially solves or at least partially solves some concerns about uh, stranded assets. Um, that, that you can utilize existing infrastructure. So perhaps uh, the two of you could, could uh, talk about how you see the transport, the transportation solution, but also talk about the partnership that, that, uh, that Baker Hughes and SNAM have created. And we'll start with Marco. Thank you, Randy. So uh, just for those of, uh, those of you who don't know us, uh, SNAM is the world's largest pipeline company outside of Russia. You can't beat Gazprom. They just have <laughs> tens of thousands of kilometers of pipes over there. But out, outside of Russia, we, we own and operate the biggest kind of gas pipeline network and, and store, gas storage uh, business. And uh, we are confident that with most of the steel that we've purchased after 1986, and, and that applies about to 80% of our pipeline system, is of a quality that we can use exactly the same pipe to transport up to 100% of hydrogen. So not only does it allow us to think about our infrastructure as opposed to a bridge infrastructure to an uncertain future as a kind of a forever infrastructure, which of course we're very uh, pleased with, but more importantly for the system, it means we can use existing infrastructure, not only from a capital point of view, but the rights of ways. I mean, to build a pipeline today in a much more urbanized world with a lot more NIMBY than when these pipes were built in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, you can see uh, a lot of challenges, even in, in North America, on kind of a new build infrastructure. And and the, but, but a lot of people say, you know, transport is an issue for hydrogen. The way I see it, is transport is the reason why hydrogen is such a big opportunity because we will eventually with renewables have to go and tap into solar 
and wind wherever it's sunny and windy, which doesn't tend to coincide where we have built uh, big cities and big economic uh, hubs and centers and industry. So to move the sun of the desert, let's keep in mind that with four hours of, of sunlight hitting the desert, we have enough energy to fuel the whole world for a year. So, so the transportability of hydrogen is a way to get that energy into our homes, into our factories, into our buses. And the test that we've done, you know, if it costs, uh, we think in 2040, 2050, uh, about let's say $0.8 a kilo to produce a solar hydrogen in North Africa, let's say $0.8 a kilo. To move that from, let's say Tunisia or Algeria to Germany is costing via pipe $0.2 a kilo. So the cost of piping gas is ultra cheap. That's why we're now here in Milan, we, we burn gas that's produced 5,000 kilometers away in Siberia. Um, it's, it's a pipeline cost is really, really cheap. With GE, we have a long tradition of, uh, Baker Hughes, we have a long tradition of cooperation before when they were GE. Uh, part of the Nuovo Pignone was actually sold from SNAB to GE in the 90s, where, which is where they build all their jet turbines and, and a, a lot of their uh, power plants. So we, we just have a great history of, of collaboration around technology. We've been the first together to experiment a blend of hydrogen and natural gas in the turbines, in the gas turbine. So Michele, to you. <laughs> Michele. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, uh, uh, Marco has, uh, has, uh, has, has articulated very, very well. I mean, I guess sort of to take a slight different uh, uh, tack is, is once again about balancing uh, the need to redistribute the center production with the center of consumption across multiple uh, different uh, sort of transportation mechanisms. Uh, you know, and there is uh, no doubt uh, that being able to just enrich uh, natural gas um, sort of pipelines with the proportion, uh, even if it doesn't get 100 percent of, uh, of hydrogen, is going to reduce the pool on natural gas, uh, you know, for for uh, for either power or uh, or heat generation. Clearly, one has to you know sort of to be uh, in balance to 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 not forget that. You know, it takes four times the amount of volume uh, of hydrogen to create the same amount of energy, uh, you know, sort of then uh, a unit of natural gas does, uh, and so that so that has to be factored into the into the equation. But there is no doubt that there are you know specific uh, stranded assets or geographic situations that you know will make uh, hydrogen an ideal uh, sort of uh, carrier uh, for uh, for energy. You know, sort of bigger use uh, um, and uh, and SNAM and uh, you know, sort of the, 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 you know, uh, when when I joined bigger use uh, and I was in Florence, uh, you know, even though bigger use is a, a U.S. based uh, company, you know, it, it felt and it was treated as being Italian, um, and uh, and uh, uh, I guess Mark has explained uh, has explained why, and we we go back a long time. You know, it was 1962, I guess, that the first hydrogen compressor was uh, in fact manufactured by uh, Mo Pignone. Uh, and then we gone all the way to, to produce 100% uh, driven, uh, uh, driven gas, uh, gas turbines. Um, but you know, so to back, back to the earlier point, uh, there, there is a place and a situation where that makes sense, but there will be places in which, you know, rather than having the middleman, uh, sort of you transport the electron directly. Because in the end of what you're doing, you know, with hydrogen, you take uh, electricity, run into an electrolyzer, generate hydrogen, move the hydrogen, and then turn the hydrogen into an electron at the other end. Sometimes that makes perfect sense because it's the only way of doing it, but sometimes you might as well take the electron, cut to the middleman, and go straight to the consumer uh, where you can. So, you know, once again, it's, it's, it's about balancing sort of the system and making sure that the most cost-effective solution is delivered for uh, for uh, the lowest um, sort of carbon footprint possible. Fantastic. Oh, Toyota son, please. Uh, well, um, I, I think transportation is really a headache for us uh, because uh, uh, Japan, as an uh, island country, we are trying to import. And, and, and so uh, uh, 
two ways at least, or three ways. I think one is uh, um, we would uh, carry uh, um, uh, um, uh, hydrogen in the form of ammonia. Mm -hmm. And another one is liquefied um, uh, ammonia. And third one is MCH. I think, uh, you know, um, uh, that uh, chemical product uh, absorb hydrogen. And uh, I think at this moment, we tend to think um, uh, ammonia as a carrier is the cheapest way uh, to transport because uh, um, um, we can continue to utilize uh, 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 existing um, um, supply chain. And, so, and last uh, uh, autumn, we tried to demonstrate uh, in cooperation with Saudi Arabia. Uh, Saudi Arabia uh, uh, produced uh, um, a zero carbon ammonia, and, and then we import uh, zero carbon ammonia um, by ships, and, and, and then we co-burn with the uh, um, uh, coal or gas, and, and also we demonstrated uh, a single firing of ammonia. And it is ex toxic, it, it's a problem, and, but, but um, if uh, professional people can use that, uh, so um, a power generation, um, um, they, can, they can deal with that. But, but uh, eventually we would like to utilize uh, uh, liquefied hydrogen uh, in a ship. Um, and, and now Japanese companies are trying to build uh, new ships uh, uh, um, uh, for liquefied, uh, liquefied hydrogen. And, and, and then eventually we would import uh, um, um, hydrogen in a, a form of um, um, liquefied uh, hydrogen. And, and, and then we could utilize for industry, utilize for um, uh, uh, transportation and for heating, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I, I, I think, uh, please think about uh, uh, a country like Japan, uh, which you need to import uh, hydrogen. Uh, we cannot have a pipeline. Toyota-san, you just uh, effectively answered uh, another question we had from Chris Midgley. Um, so uh, thank you for anticipating his question. I do want to turn to another question from the audience. <laughs> um, and I think I want to aim this to, to Robert and Michaela um, uh, uh, because uh, you, you both are entrepreneurs um, and have, have built your own companies. And Thomas uh, Mitas asks, is there any room for small hydrogen producers, or is it mostly a sport for companies that have big funding and infrastructure? Um, so Michaela and then Robert. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, I think there is lots of space for SMEs and they're not as engaged as they could should be at the moment. So, so SMEs, small, medium-sized enterprises. Um, it, I'd like to see a lot, a lot more because um, that's where the supply chain is. and. Um, and as the other panel members have said, it's, it's engaging existing supply chains and, and taking those assets and deploying them quickly. That's going to accelerate this process. So, so yeah, I think it's um, it's in my view, it's better to engage with those SMEs as well um, at the same time as as, as um, engaging the the larger adopters. Um, yeah, there's a, there's plenty of space there, and actually, legislation is again doesn't really have a, a lot of capacity for that. So, so we through industrial organisations, you can kind of get messages from SMEs uh, by aggregating the voice, and that that's one thing that we found works here in terms of influencing policy. Um, so nationally, we can do that, and, and also internationally. Robert, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's already been done right now, but small scale or large scale. In fact, uh, hydrogen, you know, has been done a small SMR, uh, people doing small SMR uh, system in order to use it in um, forklifts. It's already been done. A uh, small photovoltaic system attached to uh, a service station uh, to create uh, re electrolysis hydrogen right there at the service station. So. Just like in the energy uh, solar business, you got utility scale and then you have, you know, a home scale and that can be done with hydrogen. So absolutely, I think there's room for small size and there's room for mid size and there's room for utility scale. Got it. Thank you. We have about five minutes left. Um, I want to take one more uh, sort of round of questions 
based on uh, one of the obstacles that Marco raised about um, needing certificates, um, trying to create markets for uh, varying degrees or uh, of carbon intensity or the, the certifying the color of production, et cetera. And um, I want to ask a question to all of you. If you don't want to answer it, you don't need to. Um, uh, so just raise your hand if you will answer it, which is um, how do you feel about doing away entirely with the color coding system and trying to think about hydrogen in terms of its emissions intensity and not how it's actually produced? Uh, who, who wants to take that? Raise your hand. R Robert's going to go first and then Marco. <laughs> Okay, so Robert and then Marco and then Toyota-san. Um, we don't have that much time, so so make the answers quick. Okay, so uh, actually we are doing that already in California. And I again, in California, it's measured by carbon intensity. So whether you use biogas or whether you use uh, natural gas um, or you use electrolysis or different method, it doesn't matter. It's the carbon intensity. So it's already done and I believe that's the way to go. Thank you, Marco. I think one thing doesn't exclude the other. I totally agree there should be one liquid hydrogen market when it comes to its price, but you still need to certify where it's come from. Otherwise, you won't be able to know because it won't, you won't be able to trace how, how many emissions were generated by producing it from, from the molecule itself. So you need a very uh, detailed system of traceability. It's the same we have in oil. So mm -hmm. in oil, I mean, we, we still price stuff related to Brent or WTI, which is a tiny, tiny fraction of the overall oil market, but we need to replicate that type of traceability, which is not something we do overnight, but it's something governments should really start working on soon. But do you think the emphasis on the actual production method, whether it's green or blue or pink or turquoise or whatnot, actually clouds the issue about the how what its greenhouse gas intensity is? Because uh, some people, you know, blue blue hydrogen can be pretty pretty um, low uh, low emissions intensity, and um, and that's that's. Th there's a lot of, uh, as you said, as someone said, there's a lot of resistance to that because of it's using hydrocarbons. But actually, if you care about emissions, that might be the way to go. Yeah, but it's it's quite hard to certify the emissions, right? So you call it blue, but who knows in what whatever country it's produced, what actual emissions there were in the upstream part of the reservoir of that country. So it's really complicated. You really need to have a database and know where that has come from, which is the same we have for oil, if it's on yep. a ship or on, on a pipe, it's easier, but on a ship, then you can have people have a free rider, people will blend maybe kind of lesser quality uh, abatement with 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 the pristine kind of green uh, hydrogen. And, and you really need to watch out before the markets become unreliable, like like we've seen for credit for CO2, for instance, yep. you know, when, once you start making it, you know, you can take 10 years to build a market. And then in six months, you can destroy it if it's unreliable. So we really need to be able to trace that to where it was made. That's fascinating. Yeah, thank you. Toyota-san, you wanted to answer? Well, yeah, uh, very short answer. I think international standard is important. We, we have to use uh, um, ISO, uh, International Standard uh, Organization. And, and, and uh, in terms of uh, in carbon intensity, in terms of also carbon free footprint, we have to have an international standard. And, and then we don't have to uh, uh, worry about color. Got it. So just to emphasize that point, you know, in California, the states actually verify the carbon. So we have to show the exact pathway, the greed life cycle for how you process. You have to do that. And by the time you produce it, the state will then certify that before the, uh, the carbon intensity is, uh, is approved. So there's a whole process that's already uh, in play in, in California. Fantastic. Um, I think that that's a, a rich area for further research, frankly, is how, how to start certifying hydrogen and its emissions intensity. And it gets into a lot of different questions, particularly if you're talking about natural gas, um, where there's a lot of work being done on methane and, and trying to ensure that there's limited methane uh, uh, leakage across the whole uh, upstream, midstream, and downstream. Um, so uh, a real, really rich area. Um, I, I want to end uh, uh, with uh, Michaela. Um, Michaela, uh, you've been working on hydrogen uh, for a long time, um, and uh, and you know thir your bio says thirty years um, mm -hmm. that you've been part of the hydrogen economy. How does it feel uh, to <laughs> enter twenty twenty one and have your work sort of be the the topic of the year in in energy? 
Well, it's always seemed obvious for all of those 30 years, I have to say, and and people probably all, all feel like this on the panel, you know, it, it's been obvious and, and it's been inevitable. And I think it, it's every day it becomes more and more obvious and inevitable. So so for me, the excitement is seeing the, the hockey stick curve of activity. That, that's it. That, that Nothing else will can beat that. So it, it's great to see so much international collaboration and, and coordination. It's great. Thank you, Michaela. And thank you, everybody. Um, really appreciated this conversation. I know there's a lot to work on uh, in, on hydrogen in 2021. Um, you all are doing fantastic work and the Atlanta Council is looking forward to working with you on this topic.